So I want to give you, it's going to be experiential. Yeah? Um, we'll get up and have a different type of dialogue. But I do want to give you a bit of context so that you know where this method is coming from. And I'm going to use my mobile phone to take the time because my battery in my watch just died. So it's perfect timing. Um, so I'm not texting or looking at something else. Um, all right. So, did democracy came out of South Africa post apartheid? Right? So, this was a time when organizations started to look at how they would change to get rid of all of those um, racial discrimination laws in the workplace. And they needed something. So, Greg and Myrna Lewis um, you developed a methodology that people could take up and facilitate their own decisions and their own conflict, especially when there's a lot of emotionality. And I don't mean people crying, but um, things that are less logical and rational. Yeah? That's where it came from. <coughs> so, foundational stuff for this methodology, it uses Freud's iceberg model of conscious and unconscious. So what Freud said was, look, human psyche is like an iceberg. What we can see on top of the waterline, what is conscious, is a very small part compared to what's in the unconscious. And so our capacity and our potential lies <coughs> in the unconscious for a person. Very similar with the group. This methodology is based on process-oriented psychology. Three new branches of psychology developed by Arnold Mindel. Facilitation methodologies use that a lot. One of the key things that they use is role theory. So Arnold Mindel and Myrna Lewis talk about groups having the same kind of setup. Yeah? Now, the unconscious in a group, though, gets formed by how we make decisions. And there are three different styles of decision making that I'm going to just quickly step you through. One is our good old autocratic rule. Right? <coughs> Kings and queens <coughs> making decisions. We'll explore how that works. And then we'll talk about majority democracy. And we'll then we'll talk about why is it that this is a deeper type of democracy. A lot of people usually um, kind of go, Martin, what is this thing of a deeper democracy? I'll tell you why it's got its name. So, a king or a queen, we've got more than ones in organization and groups. <coughs> they make a decision. Only one person, one person's views are kind of being used to make a decision. When that happens, usually, you hit resistance. Right? <coughs> At the moment, you might not notice it if you're a king or a queen or in a decision-making point, but everybody kind of nods, and we take notes for agreement, which usually they are not. Right? But we then take a break, go have a coffee <coughs> or a beer, and then everybody starts talking about the real sentiment. Right? There's resistance. There's all sorts of resistance. It starts with a little, a little bit of sarcasm and a joke. It escalates. This is the alternative view, the minority view, trying to be heard by the king or the queen. It escalates until we start to gossip. Communication breaks down. There's disruption until we get to war and separation. Yeah. So we're not, I'm not saying, or the democracy is not saying that we don't need autocracy. Clearly, in some situations, we do. Imagine doing, um, you know, emergency uh, kind of prevention and, re and um, response by not being autocratic. That's not possible. Yeah. But in some instances, it's not great because you hit this resistance. Yeah. Now that's aut autocracy. In majority democracy, we've got a good old iceberg there. We take a vote. We only need 51%, right? We know what the people want, yeah? Winners look like this. Sorry. Yay, we've won. The other 49% look like that. Like, what on earth is happening? Yeah? And they don't stay like that for too long. If you know anyone that has lost a vote and they're passionate about their ideas, they mobilize. Having come from South America, this usually goes from, you know, we don't like this idea to revolution. <laughs> yeah. 
And it takes all sorts of forms, but it is a resistance line. We call it a terrorist line on purpose, because terrorism, although it's a hard topic to talk about these days, um, doesn't just come up. There is a history. It started with some sort of resistance. It started with some decisions made that they didn't include everyone. Yeah. So although the majority of democracy is the best decision-making method that we've got, it still creates this resistance. And there's a lot of people, 49%, that don't come along. Yeah. And a lot of untapped wisdom in the unconscious. So, deeper democracy. Yeah, vote is good because majorities do move groups, right? When there's a majority, it kind of tends to move groups. But how do we take it deeper? This methodology is trying to lower the waterline in the group, metaphorically speaking. We want to tap into more of that group's unconscious. And minority views, alternative views, they have got perspective. The minority view in a vote is lost in battle. Yeah? We usually drop their ideas. Yeah? But because they've got perspective, they can see something that the majority cannot see. And if we were to look at that and learn from that, we could make better decisions. Sure, majorities move groups, but we can make much better decisions than the majority vote. So we use the alternative view as a doorway to more wisdom and potential in the group. They are not the group's wisdom, they are a doorway because they've got perspective. Yeah? All right. And we want to stop that terrorism from happening or cut it short. So, that is the methodology, kind of, the theory behind it, very briefly. This is what it does. Very simple steps in terms of how to facilitate this kind of dialogue. Four steps, and there's a lot more to it. There's a lot of processes that can be learned on how to do this. Getting all the views, making it safe to say no or the alternative view. Yeah. Be, people being able to express it. Spread it. Alternative views, when someone sticks their neck out, tend to be personalized. Yeah. And if it comes in the group, you know that there isn't just one person thinking about that, there are more. But the problem is, they are not owning it. So, Martin loves, you know, alternative views, that's just Martin. That's all the people that do, right? So we want to spread it. Yet, we take a vote, but we look for the wisdom. People in the minority, what would you need to come along? We explore that question. Yeah. Majorities move groups, but what would you need to come along? With a bit of more time, we could do a personal decision-making process on that for on those four steps, so that you get a sense of how, how does it, what does it feel like. So I'll just explain it so that next time that you're making a personal decision, you give it a go. Don't put a line through the page. Not do it, not do it. That usually doesn't help, right? Explore each view fully, kind of embed it, yeah? discuss it, and find where your majority lies. And then ask your minority side, the part of you that doesn't want to go along, hey, you've got perspective, you've got something really important for me to make a decision. What does that minority in me need to come along? There's a lot of wisdom in that. And then, Use that in your decision making. That's what we're talking about for making decisions that are deeper in terms of democracy. So that's all good. If we're talking about rational, logical, conscious stuff. A lot of times we don't. When we don't, it feels like this in a group. Edgy, facilitators and people that work with groups talk about you can cut the air with that spoon. Really, you feel it. And you get stuck. The group is going around in circles. Yeah. We are right there. We're on the waterline. This is where you kind of going, there is more stuff than what we're talking about. Yeah, there's deeper stuff. Yeah, you're right. Because this metaphor uses the iceberg model. We call it a fish. There is a fish in the way of the group. There is emotional, less logical, less rational stuff in the way of our discussion. 
But we cannot use logical processes to talk about emotional stuff. It doesn't work. It's very heady. So we need a different way of teasing that out. And if it could be a sardine, or it could be a whale shark. We just don't know. Yeah? Steps are easy. The most critical thing are meta skills. The big thing of meta skill is neutrality. You need to be able to hold it, or at least know when you are in it and when you're not, and let the group know. It's about transparency. So, in terms of practice, I want to take us into a conversation about something that is more in our group unconscious, something that is um, known for all of us, and we'll explore using a process that um, takes us to this space, unconscious. Now, when I was looking at room setup, I said, I, a dialogue of this nature doesn't have tables. Yes, a bit of a challenge. So, it's dynamic, we move in space to have these kind of conversations. So, thank God, is the weather is going on? Could you check for me, Nick? Um, looks like it started raining. But I was going to be very happy if it was sunny and we could step outside. We'll see in a sec. Um, you've got a summary handout for, for yourselves um, on the tables. So that's the idea. Go diving, pop some fishes. Now, can we go outside? It's a little bit wet. We have this space stuff. If we can make this space work. Yes. Yeah? yeah? Can we we'll make it work? Okay. We'll make it work. I'll, I'll explain the steps, but you'll see that these slides have got steps. I'll explain them while we're doing it. Yeah? Um, when you get these slides, there are four steps to a dialogue that is about emotionality. These are them. We'll look at safety rules. I'll explain what throwing the arrows means, but we'll, we'll do that. We'll mine for gold, and we'll take it back to our key decision. In this case, let's explore this. It's very topical. Yeah. It would, if it were up to this group, would we have a plebiscite on marriage equality in Australia? It's because it's, when you have this kind of dialogue that we're going to have, it's going around in circles, it's stuck, it's emotional, it doesn't follow much logic or rationality. So we need a different process. So let's step outside and I'll explain. What we do after a debate like that is look at what's the learning. So in that conversation, maybe, it was very short, but usually there's, there's a stuff we react to. Sometimes even visceral, like we don't, it just kind of, yeah? Or sometimes it's because it really attracts us and we're like, oh, I love that idea. Yeah? That's the stuff to look into. In some ways, it's like we talked about arrows as a metaphor. It's like an arrow hits you. Yeah? So this is take, take your time. It's like taking out an arrow and looking at what is the grain of truth in there? What does it say about you? Yeah? So, for example, if I would be owning a grain of truth in this bit, I would be saying something like, the statement that hit me, or that I reacted to, was this one, hurts, yeah? And what it's saying about me is that I usually do, uh, or I, what is it saying about you? That's why you've reacted, it's got a message. So you've got to do it with, with, with kindness for yourself, because this stuff is not easy. Did anyone, did that, can anyone, um, own a grain of truth. Uh, did anyone react on that? Yes. Um, I reacted to it's worth the risk because yeah. for me it was like, how do you know what the risk is, and who's who's going to pay the risk? Who's the risk to who's that risk? And so, yeah, for me, I um, like I can't be comfortable with that statement. It's worth the risk because that risk. To me, it could be somebody's life, it could be their mental health, it could be their relationships, and yeah, so I can't say it's worth somebody else taking that risk. So, can you tell me if I've got it. So, what it's saying is, let me just kind of help so that 
it's, it's a mixed uh, modeling for the whole group. The statement that hit me, and you will not be alone in this, is the one that talked about, you haven't thought about the risk, and it's true. I haven't thought about the risk for all those people, and it's not worth just taking the risk in this decision. All the people feeling like that. Any other yep. person that wants to honest statement? Yes. I'm going to be greedy for the two statements. Lucy and I'm not sure of Prue. Prue. Lucy, what Lucy and Prue made me really focus in on it's not about politics politics or politicians. It's about their their families, their daughters, sons, partners. Anybody else? for whom this was a realization. All right. In this moment, we're kind of mining the wisdom in our group. Yeah? We're looking for what is it that we react to, what's, what have we learned. Yeah? The next step, if we, if we had a little bit more time, I just want to be, don't want to take the time for the next speaker, is to look at, okay, the things that each person is mentioning those are our learnings. This is our growth. It's not just for that person. It's for us as a group. Because it came up here in our discussion. The question is now, how do we operationalize it? I know the word doesn't exist, but it's operationalizing the thing. Yeah? Um, it's about taking these learnings and taking it back to where we started, where we got stuck. So should we have a plebiscite or not? Having learned what we've learned, how do we how do we use those learnings in the question of should we have a plebiscite or not? Yeah? So we will go back into that discussion. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Do you usually do this over a full day and what's the optimum group size? Like how long do you allow for each? Because these are obviously very raw. You're opening up some yes. rawness. And yes, exactly. So as, as practitioners, where can we learn more about kind of do you... Yeah. Is it... So for this, you call on this kind of process when your group is stuck or when it's divided. You know, you've got, you've got, it's divided into two and it cannot, you know, you cannot move. Yeah? You call on that process and it needs time. It just depends on the group. Some groups need more, some group, groups need less. I guess it's like that dialogic tension of being profoundly yes. open to understanding other perspectives. Yes. It kind of creates space to do that, which is constructive. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, we need this space, but you can't take a group into this place as a facilitator. The group needs to decide to go there. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Does that make sense? It won't be respectful to the group. The group cannot be taken there. You can, like, the metaphor is you can kiss a group over the edge. You cannot push them and throw them in there, in the deep end. Yeah. So is there an optimum size? Like it can be any size, but you will need more facilitators if you're talking a large group, and you need time. Yeah. And the group needs to be one thing to put it. Last question, because like we're on the time. Yeah. Are you as they were on this issue? Is yes. there, do, do you find, how do you find the pressure then on the spot minority groups to stand up there? It's a very public forum mm. for a minority group. Yeah. Yeah. The, the facilitation and the safety rules are the key. The process in itself, you know, it could be great, it could be horrible. The key is the facilitation, the facilitation, the person facilitating, the people facilitating, and the safety rules very early on. If it doesn't feel safe, we don't go there. Yeah. 